Good to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm telling you what, it was really great that we didn't have snow. It was like I got a little concerned last night when I saw it coming down like, like that. Those flakes were like that. I'm like, really? This is what we're going to do? Michigan, did you take your medicine? I don't think you did. But I was just really glad it wasn't like a really cold, freezing rain kind of a thing, because that would be worse. Let's take our Bibles. We're going to go to Luke chapter 5, if you would, please. Luke chapter 5. Okay, good. That's on. Notice I'm double-checking that fan now after I didn't do that Sunday. Wonder why I got all warm up here, and it's because I forgot to turn the fan on. So now I'm double-checking to make sure I got that fan on. It is expedient for me that I do that. <laughs> Beginning in verse 1, we're going to read 11 verses. And it came to pass that the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but fishermen were gone, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said it unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both of the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Boy, what a great account in the Bible. Just amazing. And, you know, Jesus already knew that sound carries over water. So, yeah, we didn't need microphones. We just thrust out a little bit from the land, and then you, the water carries the message. And uh, I, I love the way that God made water and the things that water does. It can do so many things. But what a miracle took place in these verses, and the Gospels are filled of the wonderful works of the Lord. So tonight... I want to bring a lesson on nevertheless at thy word. Because no matter what we do or what we think we can do, we need to just say, okay, I've done what I can do and I haven't really been that successful in it. I haven't, it's not really worked the way that it should have worked. But you know what? Nevertheless, at thy word, I'm going to do it. Because look what happened when they listened. But you notice they only partially listened. Jesus said, let down the nets, plural. And he says, I'll let down the net. Because you know what? I just washed a bunch of them. So I'll just throw a net out there and we'll see what we can do, okay? Just, just to kind of give that little bit of, well, I'm obedient. I'm going to be obedient to your word. But I, I still think that we're not going to see much happen here. There was a little bit of doubt well, that came with that. So then they had so many fish that came in that it broke the net that they put in. And then they're like, hey, give us a hand over here, guys. You wouldn't believe what's going on. And then they, they, they let all their nets down at that point. And then they, they, they brought it up and they filled both ships to the point the ships were going to sink. They were starting to go down a little bit. And, uh, and so, wow, what a great thing. But nevertheless, at thy word, 
these miracles were recorded to give us insight as to who uh, as to who Jesus Christ was and is. In John chapter twenty, verse twenty nine through thirty one, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Listen, we don't even have all the stuff he did, even with his disciples. You know, because, you know, like we, we, we talk about a little bit sometimes, like uh, how people say, oh, well, well, why isn't this in the Bible? And why isn't that in the Bible? And you know what? There was a lot of things that could have been in the Bible. But you know what? The, the, the Bible teaches us very plainly that the works of Christ, the world could not contain the book that should be written. And if you think of every library and all over the world and the thousands of pages that are the, the, and then you start thinking about that statement that the world itself could not hold or contain the book that would be written of all of Christ's work. Because he literally does everything. You know what? When, when, when Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing, you realize that he's doing everything for every single person who ever lived, who ever will live. He did all that. He's doing all the works. He's, he's, he's allowing us. He's strengthening every person. He's giving wisdom. He's answering prayers. All these different things for every specific story of every single person ever. So that would be a book that would drain the earth dry of all the, tr all the trees to make the paper to try to even hold the book. Think about that. A world that couldn't hold the book of works that Jesus did would be a world without trees because of the fact it would take all the trees on planet Earth and it still couldn't hold the, make enough paper to hold the book that would be written about what Jesus did. You think about every tree, and I'm telling you right now, if you think of every person that ever lived, even for a brief amount of time, think about every tree that ever lived. How many trees do you think there's been since the beginning? And it would have taken all of them, and the world still couldn't have hold the book of works that Jesus did. Every single tree. I've been flabbergasted when I go up north or I go down to Tennessee or I'm somewhere where there's mountain ranges and I see millions of trees everywhere. Trees, trees, trees. Everywhere. And I start thinking about that. Think about all the trees that ever were and the paper that it would have taken to even attempt to make it. You know what? It really makes a lot of sense why God condensed the Bible. Because how could we possibly fathom everything that Jesus did? We wouldn't even have time. In a world that couldn't even hold the book, how would each person read it? But we have enough that we can believe. That's what it is. We got the PowerPoint. We got the condensed lesson. We got the outline right here of all things in this Bible. It's amazing. So miracles were recorded to give us hope. Romans 15, 13, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. These miracles were also recorded for our admonition. Because we need that. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happen unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. And this admonition is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like an exhortation, but it's also like a challenge, uh, a challenging encouragement. 
You can look at it that way. It's a little bit more in depth than just a regular exhortation or encouragement. And admonition is this charged, it's a charged, uh, fully purposed, uh, fully functional kind of thing that we are used to, to, to help build us, to teach us, to challenge us, to engage us, to get us engaged in the actual things of God. These are, this is what preaching does. Preaching is supposed to and teaching is supposed to get the word of God inside of us and we're supposed to be receiving it and finding ways we can apply it in our lives that we can live it out. The Bible is meant to be lived, not just studied, not just held, not just quoted. It's to be lived out in the life of the believer. The more we can absorb, the more we can observe. We can't observe to do whatsoever he's commanded unless we've absorbed whatsoever he's commanded. You have to be scriptural before you can be spiritual. I've said that a thousand times because it's the truth. We have to have our, our, our spirituality depends on our adherence to scripture because otherwise it's false. It's false ground to stand on. If we just stand on what we believe to be spiritual and not what's actually scriptural to build our life on, then we're, we're missing. We're not standing. That's sinking sand. That's illusion. That gives you the illusion that you're, that you're being spiritual somehow. And that's what the modern-day churches of today want to try to do. They're building everything on the illusion of spirituality. Well, if I stand, if I stand and sway and I sing long enough, then all of a sudden I'm spiritual. Or if I do this or if I do that, then I'm spiritual. No, in order to be spiritual, we have to be scriptural. And what does the Bible say? What does the Scripture say? Say, what saith the scripture? They didn't search their feelings daily. They searched the scriptures daily to see what those things were said were so. And when they found out that what, that what was being preached was what was in the scripture, they believed. Many believed because of the, the, the that's why, you know, that old saying, check me out by the book. Yeah, listen. You look at the scripture. What does the scripture say? Because that's that's all I, I know how to give you. I can just point you to the Bible. That's all I know how to do. I can point you to the Bible. You can look at words of man, you can seek out words of wisdom, but there's no greater there's no greater direction of wisdom than the Bible and the scriptures. So there's no better place to turn than the scriptures, and that should be the first place we turn. Not to counselors, not to anybody else. We turn to the Bible. And if you're not sure about it, if you don't know where to look, you know what? That's what your preachers are for. Hey, you know, I'm really struggling with this, or I really have this question or that question. I'm trying to find something. Uh, do you know anywhere in the scriptures, or can you help me research uh, what might be, what, what, what God, what the scriptures might have to say about this? And we can help you, and we often have. I've had many people come to me and ask me things, and, and, and I've done, if I didn't have the answer right then, I said, give me a little bit of time. I'll look into it. I'll get you the answer that you need, and as soon as I get that answer, I'll get a hold of you, and, and then you'll, you'll be able to go from there. It's, it's, it's really an easy thing. So... We, we've been given these things that we might believe. We might be given these things that for our admonition. And notice that the Lord got into Simon Peter's ship and he prayed him to thrust out. Simon uh, Peter was in the boat with him. He taught the word of God to both Simon Peter and, because he was listening. He was right there for the message. Even though he was kind of busy, he had his ear tuned to what Jesus said. And I love how, uh, how, he's, uh, how he answers him. He, he answered him, Master. Simon answering in verse 5 said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. He already knew Jesus Christ was the master at that point. And he referred to him as such. So then he went on and he followed directions at least partially followed directions, but he realized real quick he should have followed them to the T, 
Because now, not only are you going to have to deal with that net, it's now busted. You were worried about just having to wash the thing again. Now it's broke. Now you got to sit there and try to mend it so it can be used again. So, you know, Jesus, he taught the word of God to both P Peter and the people. And when he had left off speaking, he, he, he sent for them to launch out into the deep and let down the nets. The drop means a haul. You're going to get a haul up. You're going to get a real big haul of fish. Come on out there. And he's like, yeah, we've just been up all night. But nevertheless, man, what great word. Isn't that a great word? Jesus used that same word. Father, let this bitter cup, if it's possible, let this bitter cup pass. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Nevertheless is a really good word. Nevertheless, I'm going to do it. So his teaching gave the people knowledge of who he was and the will of God. We do the same thing here. We, we give out, we give the people word, the word of God. We find uh, the revealed will of God in our lives. And it was only after the teaching that the Lord commanded him to launch out into the deep. Listen, God will always instruct you before he tells you to take off. He'll always do that. He gave them instruction first, then told him to launch out into the deep. So, you know, some people just get a little jump, jump the gunish, and uh, they, they're trying to launch before they have a chance to even hear what God has to say. Let God speak to you before you go racing off. Let him speak to you. It's only after the teaching he commanded him to launch into the deep, and God grows us through his word for the tasks ahead. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, very familiar this command, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And I, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, the Word of God is the agent for which we find faith. That's why the, the Word of God is synonymous with getting faith. In any respect, whether you're not saved, whether you've never believed, for the first time, or whether you've been saved for 70 years, and, and, you're, and, and you're, you're hearing the word of God, it cements and draws and brings in faith. Without the word of God, without the scripture, we can't really have faith, because that's how it's conveyed. We get faith by getting in the Bible. That's why it's important. It's even so important that you should not just wait for Sunday and Wednesday to do it. Right. You should be in that book every day, getting faith for today's faith, today's things you'll face. You're going to face things today, and you know what? When you, when you get on a Friday, you can't depend on Wednesday's faith. You need Friday's faith to handle Friday's issues. It's that you, it's just right on. You need to be in the Word of God every day to help you face that day's challenges. But you know what? When you do that consistently, when Sundays and Wednesdays come around, you'll find that your portion is double. Because you already, you already have good faith and you get in there and you get a big, it's just like dessert after Thanksgiving meal. Just the topper. Get some banana pudding, amen, right there. Right after a good meal. It's just the topper on it. I'm not starving when it comes time, right? We should never come to the house of God starving. We should come hungry, hungry but not starved, okay? That is the key, and the only way to not be starved spiritually when you get here is to make sure you're eating. Can you imagine if you guys just ate on Sunday morning and Sunday night 
and Wednesday night physically, and you didn't need anything else for the rest of those times? That would not make for a bunch of happy camp. Do we even have a, a, a pandemic of hangry? We would have a bunch of hangry people. That's hungry anger. For those of you who don't know what hangry is, that's going to be your new word when somebody gets all jumpy and bitter. You're hangry, aren't you? Have a Snickers. Don't go Betty White. Have a Snickers. You're not yourself. And, and that's, that's important to come to the house of God, hungering for the word, thirsting for the word, but not dehydrated and not starved. Our problem, people, is we starve ourselves. You know, and, and every so often it's good to try to do a, a, a physical fast for your body. Your body will react well. It does good things. But you can't live in fasting mode. You can't do it. But when we do that to ourselves spiritually, it affects both worlds. It affects the spiritual world and the physical world. Whereas the physical will just affect the physical. The spiritual affects both. It can either strengthen both or, or deplete both. So the word of God is the agent which we find faith, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The concept, is, the concept is the same today as it's always been. God has always spoken to man in order to produce faith, and man then believes God, and then he finds rest and peace. When we don't have rest and peace, it's because we have not chosen to believe God. And why don't we believe God? Because we haven't been in the Bible to get the faith we need to believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, not by the word of anyone else or anything else. Now, Simon Peter's heard God's word. He's been ordered by the Son of God to launch out, let out his nets for a draught. He explains, and he's already telling the Lord, I don't want to let you down here, but we kind of already hit all this all night, and there's nothing out there. You know, we're the, per we're the pros here. Uh, we live at this. This is our world. We might not do other things well, but we have this down. We're good. This is our livelihood. This is what we do. We know. They don't know that Jesus knows every fish in the sea. And he calls them out. Help me out with a little life lesson, boys. We got a couple of ships that need to believe. We got a couple. You know what? And sometimes the thing you think is going to sink you is really just God bringing something so that you'll, you'll believe that he's got it, that he is in control. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will launch out. But he still didn't really believe fully because he only threw down the one net. But Simon catches more than all of them, and he handles this in verse 6 and 7. He saw the miracle. He confessed his own sinfulness. He's like, oh, Lord, depart from me. I'm a wicked man. I'm a sinful man. I can't even believe that I would doubt this. I can't believe that I would not know fully that when you told me I was going to get a draught of fish, that I was going to get a huge draught of fish. Now, had... Simon been in the place of full belief, not only would he have, I believe, knowing being an experienced fisherman, I believe, number one, that he would have called the other boat before they even threw out the nets. Guys, we're going to meet out here. There's going to be a huge draw to fish. Throw every net you got in there. I believe that's the, that's the way that it would have went down had Simon been the way that we should be. Had Simon just believed Jesus and believed and trusted in what Jesus said, he would have got everybody else involved and in full obedience to the Lord. And that's, that's the lesson that we can learn there. But if you watch, you know, if you watch the lives of the apostles, there's some things, some changes that you find in their faith. 
which is always cool to find out and to see. You know, they, they received him as the Savior in the beginning. They marveled at his miracles during his ministry. They had forsook him and fled in the Garden of Gethsemane. They cowered in fear after his resurrection. But then they boldly preached after Pentecost. They died giants of the faith in their end as an example to all. From denying the Lord three times to seeing over 3,000 souls saved with one sermon. Man, there's some big changes that went on. Paul said, for I have learned. You know, that's, this is what being a Christian is all about is learning. And that's why you need to be in a Bible class. That's why you need to be in a prayer meeting or Bible study where we can look because we learn. The more we learn, the more we can find ways to apply it. Because you know what? Learning is not just the information. This is something that I've really started thinking about uh, a lot recently because it's not just the absorption of the information, but you also have another part of learning, and that is learning in the spiritual application here as well, is to not only learn what the Bible says, but to learn where it fits in your life and where to put it. That is, those things go together. They, they lock together. We need to learn what the Bible says, but then we need to learn where to put it in our lives. And that is it's just like packing up a truck when you're moving. You got to, you know, and you're hoping that you'll be able to remember where everything went. But it's like, you, 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 there's a certain way that you have now. I know I've got all these boxes. I know I got all this furniture. I know I got all this stuff. Now I got to learn where to put it in the truck. What's going to fit in the truck? Uh, how do I have to do it? Maybe I've learned over the years that you don't stack it this way. Don't stack it that way. You stack it this way. Or I can get more on top if I do this. There's little things that we learn how to apply in our lives that greatly benefit us. And if we'll do that, if we'll take the Bible, we'll learn it and we'll study our lives with what we've learned and we say, where does this fit? Where can I put this in my life? Right, I've been shopping before uh, with, with my wife and we'll come across something and, and my wife will, will want it or whatever and, and, and she'll, she'll say, can we get this? And I'll say, well, where are we going to put it? Where are we going to put it? We've got this. And then she'll be like, oh, well, if we do this and we move this to this side, we could put this over there. Okay, well, that makes sense. All right. You know, it, learning where to put it, making it fun. When you're setting up your room, sometimes, uh, and, and I did this, uh, I did this when we first moved in our house uh, we had we had our furniture set up kind of strange because it's a it's a small smaller space, and it just wasn't really functioning well with the room if you know what I mean. The flow just wasn't there, and now um, later on we we moved some things around, and I thought, well, what if we move this over here and then we move this over there? And I, I came up with this idea. And, of course, my wife being a decorator, I, had, I, I went to her and I've been like, I have an idea. Can we do it? And then she's like, well, you know, well we can try it and see, see, what it, see what it is, you know. I'm like, okay, great. I said, if you don't like it, I'll put it all back right where you want it, you know, right. I just want to see. I want to try something. Because I'm constantly, I, I'm a loader. That's what I, you know, I used to load. I, I, I know how to build a truck. I can get stuff in there that normal people don't get in there. So I'm like, yeah, uh, let me let me let me play around with a few things and see what you think. And I have a new I have a new thing that I did in the living room. And now there's a walkway and it's all open when you walk in, uh, and it's and it flows better. And we we uh, the more we left it there, the more we realized this works. This is actually working. This is good stuff. And. It, you just got to take the information of what you have and learn where to put it to where it makes sense, where it flows good. A lot of times we will try to apply it, but we'll, you know, it ends up being a Tetris mess, you know, where, where it's all just all over the top. If you've never played Tetris, you need to do it. It's just fun. 
all these little different size parts are coming down and you can rotate them and you got to make it and line everything up and things disappear to make more room. Otherwise it goes to the top and you lose. It's so cool. It's so fun. A lot, a lot of, it's going to be frustrating too, if you don't, don't get it right. But, but just like that, you're finding where it goes. You're not just throwing it in a room. You're trying to learn where to put it to where it makes sense. So if we'll think about that as we're doing it, it'll help us. Paul said, I've learned. It is not, nevertheless, at the word, but at thy word we will launch out and let down our nets. Can, God, can the word of God be relied upon? Of course it can. God says to do it, that's what we should just do. So we just need to trust him to do it. If God says he'll do it, if God says that it should not be done, then don't do it. Don't try it. But you can trust God's word when the enemy seems undefeatable. Psalm 59, 1, deliver me from mine enemies, O my God, defend me from them that rise up against me. Isaiah 59, 19, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Secondly, you can trust God's word when circumstances seem insurmountable. Psalm 61, 1 through 4, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer from the end of the earth. Will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covered of thy wings, Salah. Thirdly, you can trust God's word when defeat seems intimate. Sometimes we look and we say, man, this just, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We, we tend to look at it like that sometimes. But in Psalm 142, verse 1 through 7, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, when thou knewest, uh, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walk, have they privily laid a snare for me? I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Fourthly, you can trust God's word when all human help is lost. You know, God uses people, but sometimes there's nothing anyone can do but God. Sometimes when people, when it, when it fails on the people end of things, God is literally all we have. And he can still do it whether they do or not. Psalm 142, 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, no more cared for my soul. Psalm 22, 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Psalm 37, 40, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them, and he shall uh, deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Fifthly and lastly, you can trust God's word when all hope seems to be gone. Job 19, 10, he hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone, and mine hope hath he removed like a tree. Psalm 146, 5, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord God. Our hope, see, is not in circumstances. It's not in man or mankind. It's not in machines. Our hope is in the Lord. It's in the Lord. We often sing a song, and part of that song says, I am so glad I learned to trust thee. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. I'm glad I learned to trust thee. That songwriter knew that it was a learning experience. 
because much we have to learn. And so that's all I have for uh, this evening. Uh, I will give you, if you want to look at it uh, on your own, as I just, I don't have uh, a lot of time left for that, but if you want to look at Isaiah chapter 43 uh, and uh, the first four verses of that, um, that'll, that'll be a, a, a good blessing for you as well. So, but that's, that's what we need to do. We need to be, uh, we need to be like Peter in that we say, nevertheless, at thy word, because that's an important thing at thy word.